Uh, Bulavinakan, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to, of course, uh, acknowledge the acting director and his deputy and everybody else here, in particular the, the staff who've helped organize this, um, this particular workshop you've had for the past couple of days. I thought I'd do something a bit different uh, today and maybe make a few uh, remarks and then uh, perhaps uh, before concluding, uh, open up the floor for any questions you may have. Uh, in particular, given that legal aid plays a very pivotal role in respect of the uh, implementation of the uh, rights of Fijians, in particular where you've been given constitutional uh, uh, eminence, if you like, um, regarding the delivery of services and indeed ensuring that the rule of law in Fiji is maintained. Uh, for a number of decades in Fiji, as you would look upon our history, you know, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, in 2000, etc., and post-2000, a lot of people who talked about the rule of law uh, simply did it as a cliched term uh, without necessarily understanding what the rule of law actually encompasses, what's the actual essence of the rule of law. Of course, the rule of law uh, fundamentally is about ensuring that the law is applied equally to everybody and ensuring when the application of the law does take place, it is applied equally to everybody too. So in other words, you cannot have laws that are discriminatory, and when you do have laws, you don't, for example, say, well, we'll ensure that the law actually will apply to this group of people, it won't apply to the other group of people. This is the fundamental essence of rule of law. But of course, it has, it has a lot more nuances than that. There's a lot more um, uh, finesse to uh, application rule of law. Um, you know, the, the fundamental issue regarding accessibility to the law is your ability to be able to afford that particular access, your ability to be able to understand that particular law, your ability to be able to know that there are various avenues available to you to be able to access the law. Many countries, not just Fiji, but many countries throughout the world actually have a fundamental problem in this. And you know, there's a saying that used to be a saying that only the rich can use the law and the poor can't. So lawyers may be too expensive, the people who may not be literate, may not be well connected, do not know how to use the law, do not in fact even know that there is a particular law that can be used. Or even when the law is used against them, they do not know how to actually be able to present their side of the, of the case. So this is why in the formulation of the 2013 Constitution, uh, it was seen pivotal to ensure that people have access to legal aid. Because that is the only way you can actually ensure that the rule of law is practically implemented, is the accessibility to the law. Can you imagine if tomorrow we shut down legal aid, when apart from you all losing your jobs, if you do not have any funding, forget, put that aside for a minute. You know through your own experience how all of you, whether you are lawyers or whether you support staff, how many Fijians, literally thousands of Fijians, are assisted by you? Where will they go? Where will they go? How will they access the law? How will they be able to defend their rights, know their rights? Just think about it for a minute. And then, when you think about that, think about prior to the legal aid being legal aid where it is today, what it was like for those Fijians who weren't able to afford that accessibility or indeed have access to that particular framework of legal assistance. So you can hopefully very quickly surmise that it was in fact a very tragic situation. And that tragedy in fact continued in Fiji during our colonial times, post-colonial times. And when you actually have that, it also sets in place a culture within any country, it's not something peculiar to Fiji also, a culture where people want to access the law through ways that are outside the legal framework. That's when corruption creeps in. That's when clientelism creeps in. That's when who you know, your social status, all of those things creeps in. And that then fundamentally undermines the actual premise of the rule of law. Because as one would argue that people need to survive in this world. In the same way, you know, I, was, uh, I mentioned a story many years ago that when you have police officers in those days being paid five or six thousand dollars a year, a salary, 
That's what it was like for a constable. $6,000 salary a year. And then you have McDonald's and all these other wonderful entrapments of modern day life. You have television and the police officers, children will be watching television. They'll be seeing ads for McDonald's. And then you have somebody driving along where that police officer stops for speeding. And that person is extremely wealthy. And that person, because they don't want to pay the fine, offers some money. What do you think will be the appetite of that officer to take that money? So when you have disparity in society, when you have huge disparity in society, it leads to schisms within, it leads to fractures, fissures, whatever you may call it, within the frame of, framework of rule of law. So it is critically important to understand that addressing these issues, you have to take a holistic approach to it. You have to address inequalities, for example, in respect of salaries, in particular those who are at the forefront of enforcing the law. You have to ensure that those people who cannot afford accessibility to the law, they actually do get, have mechanisms placed through which they can access the law, which is legal aid, funded, of course, by the state, because the state is extremely neutral. Imagine if, for example, you are being funded by some private company, and they may be one of your clients may have a particular issue or legal matter with that private company, <coughs> whose side will you be on? It is critically important to ensure that conflicts of interest are actually uh, reduced, in fact, re uh, eliminated altogether. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting the situation to you and asking you to juxtapose that vis-a-vis -vis what happened previously and what legal aid is doing now for you to be able to understand the critical role that this organization plays, the critical role that all of you play as individuals. And as I've said to the support staff, they are no less important than the legal staff. And the legal staff are no less important than the support staff, because everybody needs to work together as a team. So I hope you appreciate the role that you are playing and appreciate the fact that you also have been given a constitutional provision, that you're constitutionally mandated to actually function. You are the largest law firm in Fiji. And in fact, you are the, la you are the only law firm that I would consider <coughs> that in fact has such kind of workshops. I don't think even the SG's office has workshops where they come and you know, focus fundamentally on things like uh, building up your uh, your, you know, uh, looking after yourself, building up your self-esteem, all that kind of, you know, personal, personal related uh, self-building exercise and focus on that. Predominantly lawyers traditionally in this country have been focused only on legal subjects. So I think uh, you, you are quite uh, in a very enviable position. Uh, I'm sure many uh, lawyers who work for other law firms will actually be envious of the positions you have and I'd like to, of course, thank the the director for facilitating these kind of workshops because you know building your self-confidence, ensuring where you are, striking a balance between your work and your personal life and how you conduct yourselves, in fact, is a very important part of, of, of your individual career. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to highlight that to you. Of course, I mean, you know, providing legal services can be very difficult, in particular in, in small towns. Um, now society, of course, is changing. Uh, you have, you know, you, you yourselves are embarking on this digital age. The types of services now you're providing through the digital age is quite phenomenal. It's a wonderful tool if used appropriately, if used correctly. And I'm sure some of you may actually come across cases that may be related to social media that you may have to deal with. But that's the reality of the 21st century. And you have to be able to understand how that works how you should utilize it, how you in personally in your own lives, well, how you conduct yourselves. Unfortunately uh, for you, unlike us, uh, when I was a 14, 15, 16 year old boy at Morris Brothers High School and even at universities, the things we used to get up to, if people had photographs or phone cameras in those days, we'd be in trouble today. So from one perspective, from one perspective, you as professionals and the young people of today's Fiji and the rest of the world 
are more under the spotlight than ever before. In fact, people's personal lives have become public lives for many. And unfortunately, many people don't respect privacy also at the same time. I mean, you know, I, I, I mentioned a case some time back about how there was a, a young uh, woman who somebody placed a camera in her room, uh, in her bedroom, and there were live streaming images, as you would in your own bedroom, get dressed, undress, whatever you do. It was all being live streamed. That could never happen in Fiji 20 years ago, 25 years ago. That's happening now. What somebody has for breakfast this morning, or had for breakfast, could be known by thousands of people within five minutes of them having that particular sausage or whatever it was. <laughs> That's the reality. I have seen people, whilst they're eating, taking photographs and saying, I'm having this, and they post it. Please wait a minute, I'm about to go to the loo, I'll be back. <laughs> it's a fact. Now that completely changes the dynamics of human relationships, of the level of intrusion, if you like, into people's lives. What are the ramifications? You may be having a very well-meaning social engagement with somebody, and somebody can take a photograph of that and portray that in a very negative manner. And maybe the photograph they've taken of you or who you're with could have impact on the, the next day when you're appearing in court. There, those are the kind of pressures you face. But it also means that you need to be able to understand how you should conduct yourself within that environment. I'm not saying go and live in a hole and hide yourself away from everybody but you need to be able to understand the environment you work in and the implications and, in, and indeed the ramifications of that. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I, um, I, was, uh, I, I went to my old school just a few days ago and it kind of uh, set me on a, a memory lane and where some of the people are. In fact, got me thinking about certain things. I remember when I first started the DPP's office, of course, you people all, all defend people. We were prosecuting people. And there was a particular case where a 10-year-old um, girl was actually raped by her 21-year-old cousin. And um, it was quite interesting because the, the cousin was charged. And it's a small town, without mentioning actual names. And um, after a while, the, the boy's parents went and met with the the victim's parents, in particular the father, and did, did a bulumbulu and all was forgiven. And then they said the charges need to be withdrawn. But the mother and the girl said that they wanted to pursue with the particular case, or with the particular charge. And the police station in those days that was actually handling this rape or sexual assault case, said, okay, that's fine. But then the matter was referred to us because we had just at that time started the no-drop policy. So we pursued the particular matter, given in particular the fortitude and the, um, uh, the fortitude uh, and the bravery, if you like, of the, of the mother. The reason why she was even more brave, because the person who actually allegedly raped was the sister's son. So that's how close the relationship was. Now, on the day of the prosecution itself, it was a very small courthouse, and um, there were no screens. Uh, we could not even find a mat so that the victim, when giving the evidence, did not have to look at the alleged assault, uh, uh, assailant. And uh, the room was actually quite small, but there were louver windows all around. So everybody was around watching through the louver windows. Uh, we made the application to have the, everybody moved out of that space, but the magistrate refused that. The level of sensitivity in those days was somewhat uh, not as high or you know, marked as, as we have today. Uh, we asked for a mat and it was not given or some cloth. Anyway, the, what actually ended up happening was the, we had a successful conviction um, there were certain questions that 
after proving that there was actual, in, you know, in legal terms, penetration, um, and that's where the matter should have ended. The magistrate wanted to get further gory, detailed information. It was quite a painful exercise. And whilst we actually said there's no need to go any further because we had actually proved the elements of the actual offence, uh, he insisted upon that. And then when the person was actually convicted, and then there was, of course, mitigation, and it was actually quite a, um, um, uh, e emotional matter because the, the actual person who was uh, convicted by now was the only support for the parents, and the parents were in the 70s. And all the, the other children of the parents had, in fact, gone off to, you know, the big, big city lights. So he was sentenced, um, I think, it, uh, from memory, is about two and a half years. And then we all walked from the courthouse to the police station. And the convicted person by now, his mother was being consoled by the victim's mother because they were sisters. So uh, what I did was I rang up the Women's Crisis Center and I asked that they provide counseling to the victim because there was already a particular level of ostracization of the victim and the mother because they were seen to have brought about this hardship uh, onto the person who was convicted. The reason why I'm demonstrating this particular matter is that there are so many issues that come out from this very, this, this case. Not just about gender sensitivity, but about uh, the particular uh, issues that you as lawyers will need to be aware of, but also be sensitive to. Uh, you need to understand the dynamics of human relationships. Of course, all of that has changed now uh, a lot more differently in the way because you have a lot more finesse in the Crimes Act. Uh, you have a lot more sensitivity around gender training. Uh, you have a lot more, of course, support base that does exist. But in this 21st century, there are many other new elements that have come in. So I, I, what I wanted to say that I appreciate the work that you do. I appreciate the, the pivotal role that you do play. But I think it is also critically important for you to be able to understand the dynamics that you actually operate in. And it's critically, aware, critically important for you to be able to thoroughly understand that. And as I've said to many of the staff that I've spoken to other ministries, please read. It is very important for you to always read. I don't mean just reading your cases, but I mean reading outside work about what may be considered peripheral issues to your work. But if you're able to enhance your level of knowledge and aware and have a sense of awareness of what is happening around you in Fiji, outside Fiji, it does make you a better professional, whether you're a lawyer, whether you support staff. And that helps you contribute to the organization. Uh, before I open the floor, I think what is one last point I want to make is that, and I think it's critically important to understand this, because uh, Fiji, in a way, is going through this state of transition, and has been going through a state of transition, with an enormous focus on building strong institutions. All strong countries throughout the world that have done well, politically, socially, economically, have always had strong institutions. You are a constitutional institution. So the institution is bigger than all of us put together. And the preservation of that institution is critically important. So please always understand, your loyalty is to the Legal Aid Commission to ensure that the Legal Aid Commission fulfills its mandate. So if you have a colleague, if you have a senior, if you have somebody who reports to you not doing the right thing, and you have certain procedures under which they should be whether disciplined under or be called upon, you must ensure that is enforced. Because by not following systems, procedures, processes, you will undermine the very institution that you're supposed to be serving. And you'll fundamentally, over a period of time, 
the institution will become worthless. I was quite astounded recently that one of the independent institutions made uh, implicit threatening remarks against another independent institution saying, essentially saying, do not say this about me because we have the power to investigate you. Do not ever misuse any powers that you have, both as an institution and as an individual. There is a complete inappropriate way to use any statutory powers that you may have, any common law powers that you may have, any powers that you may have even as a professional. It's critically important to ensure that that, that does not happen. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, um, before I kind of round off, I, I thought it would be a good opportunity we don't kind of get these kind of sessions and I know the director and I had a number of discussions. Uh, whether it's about you know uh, issues that you may see that's arising. I mean, I know some people have recently said to me, and indeed we made the announcement in the budget, that legal aid, for example, should attend to matters pertaining to land uh, issues. And we know that, uh, for example, in places like Banu Levu, uh, there are a lot of institutional issues pertaining to land. And we've, uh, we've said the legal um, aid should extend the mandate to that area. But any questions you may want to ask, anything, you can ask me about anything you want. It does not have to be related to legal aid. Uh, it can be about Warwick, even if you want, whatever the case may be. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I wish you a good afternoon. Mm -hmm. One, two, three.